Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening's live stream presentation. My name is John. I am the tattoo historian. And I'm once again joined by my great friend, the Silver Fox himself. <laughs> Pete Carmichael, director of the Civil War Institute of Gainsborough College. What's up, buddy? How are you? I'm doing fine, John. And I know that every one of our viewers, when they look at the backdrop behind you, they all know it has to be the city line of Ottawa, Canada. That's as right. I saw yep. it. I'm like, got that's Parliament right. back there. It is. It's, yeah. It's, yeah, you're yeah. Sort of blocking Parliament, but yeah, my head's in the way. Obviously, <laughs> it usually is. <laughs> so, uh, well, John, this evening uh, we have uh, with us Beth Parnitska. Beth, although she doesn't claim me publicly, I've discovered. <laughs> she was one I try of not. Is that Beth? Go right ahead. With your disclaimer. <laughs> Oh, yes. Um, I'm a member of the Survivor Pete Carmichael Club. Um, I believe I'm now the founding member. We just started it as soon as we realized that the support group was needed. <laughs> there, are, there are some others, uh, victims of mine from UNC Greensboro, <laughs> Carolina. You've got to, you got to gain your, get your, all your forces together here. So I'll just say a little bit about Beth. Beth is a native of West Virginia, did her undergraduate at WVU, Go Mountaineers where we worked together and where Beth, um, we took, she took a Civil War class with me and then she and I talked about her career aspirations. Uh, she started as a volunteer at Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Park, uh, following that up with a summer as a seasonal, uh, where she got to wear the green and gray and the Ranger Rick hat. And uh, from there it's history as they say, she graduated, I can't remember the year. You can fill that in, Beth, if you like at some point. And she went straight- 21. 21, she was straight from, uh, from undergrad right to Fredericksburg National Park, Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Park as a permanent, as a permanent historian slash interpreter. Uh, she rose up the ranks. Um, her site that she uh, was in essentially in charge of was the Chancellorsville Visitor Center. And then from there, she has recently accepted a position at Appomattox as Chief of Interpretation. So she is, you've been at, at Appomattox for how long, uh, Beth? Um, a year and a couple months now. A year and a couple mm -hmm. months. So uh, I can say, and I don't want this to go to Beth's head, is anyone who knows Beth knows that she has a massive ego. You can just look at this young woman. <laughs> <laughs> it oozes ego. It's I uncontrollable. I, I, <laughs> I will say that Beth Parnitska, you have these, when you write letters for students to go on to graduate school, you have to rank them. And the questions are utterly absurd for the most part. <laughs> There's one question that I find especially ridiculous, except this one question, uh, it makes sense when I think of Beth and what Beth did at WVU. And that question is, does this candidate rank within the top 3% of undergraduates you've ever taught? And I can say without question or hesitation that Beth is within that category. My only regret, Beth, as you well know, is pleased as I am that you're in the Park Service and doing as well as you have. God, I'd have loved to have seen you in a graduate seminar. And I should add, I did see you in a graduate seminar because Beth sat in. My graduate seminar. <laughs> it's crazy nerdy of you, Beth, and that's not like you no. at all. Uh, I was the junior too, you know. And then I sat in on Dr. Lusky's seminar the next year. I you just couldn't get enough. <laughs> so you did get your taste. So, um, Beth, I'd like to just start to get a, a feel for what led you to Civil War history and the career path that you've taken. That's a good question. You know, it really, most people, when you ask them that question, who are in this field, have these glowing nostalgic memories of being taken to battlefields as children. And uh, that just isn't my story. Um, I mean, my, my family visited some historic sites, but um, not really, not that many. And uh, so for us, well, for me, it was really when I got to about high school and was considering a lot of careers in science and engineering but realized that what I really loved was history. And um, I just happened to, I was, I was bored in class one day because I forgot my book. 
um, which is the downfall of every nerd the day you forget your book. So I picked one up off the shelf and I happened to be in a sociology class and the teacher there also taught a civil war class. And I started reading and I just thought that it was the most fascinating people that I had ever read about, um, Victorian Americans in the middle of the civil war. And so that's really what fascinated me was looking at these people who were dealing with the most cataclysmic moments of their lives and, um, and in some ways the nation's life and trying to figure out how to navigate those situations. And they were just far enough away to be strange and just close enough to be very familiar at the same time. And so it's, it's been the people all along for me. So you get to Chancellorsville, Fredericksburg, um, again, as a seasonal and now as, and then as a permanent historian, could you just tell us a little bit about some of the things that you did there? And I, I'm not necessarily saying in terms of accomplishments, but, but I think, you know, our audience is interested, you know, what does it mean to be a park interpreter slash historian at a place like Fredericksburg? Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, it means a lot more paperwork than most people expect, but we are the federal government, so we do a lot of that. Um, on the more fun side of things, it involves you know, managing volunteers, getting to work alongside really passionate volunteers every day, um, handing up brochures, helping visitors to figure out where they want to go and how they want to spend their day. Uh, the most fun part is leading programs, so daily programs, but most especially special programs because that allows us to do extra research and really dig into these stories. Um, while I was at Fredericksburg in Spotsylvania, so I was there from um, 2011 until 2019, which means I was there for the thick of it for their 150th anniversary commemorations. And that was really the highlight for me. Um, also the National Park Service Centennial, but really those 150ths where we could lead. I mean, I led up to a, a seven hour battlefield hike at Spotsylvania one day. So it's everything from short, 35 minute programs every day with visitors to all day hikes. And it's so, really incredible. So your favorite favorite tour that you like uh, and why? Um, favorite tour of all time that I like? And I'm not talking about a specific or, date or a specific okay. group. I'm talking about, you know what, if I yeah. have to give a tour at, because remember you've got four battlefields at Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania, Chancellorsville as well as Wilderness. You have the Jackson Shrine, which has been renamed to something else, Jackson Death Site or something Jackson like that. Jackson Death Site. Yes. Yeah. And uh, then, you're asking me to choose among my favorite children, Pete. This is yeah, well, you got to. We all do. <laughs> That's my favorite of my household. I, well, I won't ask about that. But um, so my favorite topic wise is Spotsylvania, but the tour of the, of the normal tours that I've written, my favorite is Fredericksburg. There's just um, usually you have your larger groups, so you can have a little more discussion, which is what really makes things interesting for me. But the story at Fredericksburg is one that is, I think for most visitors, uh, it feeds their cynicism, a cynicism that the Northern War effort was bungled from the beginning, that these men at Fredericksburg died largely in vain, and that finally, um, that the battlefield itself at Fredericksburg in front of Marie's Heights is because it's almost entirely gone to development, Again, people come and they're somewhat disappointed because it doesn't really look like a battlefield. And then the story itself is not one that is sort of life affirming. So how did you deal with that visitors uh, who wanted to walk away from Fredericksburg to say, this battle here is further evidence of a Northern war effort that was horribly misguided and resulted in the needless slaughter of men. That's an awful lot to come up against, Pete. Um, <laughs> so honestly, a lot of our visitors were not that knowledgeable about Fredericksburg. So most of them did not come in and think um, quite on that nuanced level, but most of them did know. And so usually I would use, it might seem a little bit trope uh, or of a trope from an interpreter, but um, usually you start to break down those barriers by talking about Ambrose Burnside. So it all starts with sideburns um, as so many things do. And, um, once you can find that little bit of, of level ground there with people. So, okay, so what does everybody know about Ambrose Burnside? And everyone immediately, there's always like that one person in the crowd that would start like too shy to say anything, would start sort of rubbing their face. <laughs> and then um, you can say, that's right. He's only, he's best known for his sideburns. So uh, that probably doesn't mean he was a great general, does it? <laughs> and then um, from there, you can start into here's Burnside's career before Fredericksburg. Here's what he th he's thinking uh, about during Fredericksburg. Here's the pressures that he's facing from high command, bringing in the Emancipation Proclamation. And once people 
you know, once you really start to bring in all of these other factors, people start to see it more from, in that case, Ambrose Burnside's point of view. And once I think you kind of leveled things out, then people get into more of a learning mode and a discussion mode. And so for me, it was asking a lot of um, questions that they could get in, that they could dig into as well. So it's giving people enough information and then saying, okay, so what do you think? So um, the last question that I asked everybody on my programs was, all right, so battle's over, complete union disaster, Ambrose Burnside looks terrible, um, even his next campaign attempt fails miserably, should Abraham Lincoln sign the Emancipation Proclamation? And that shifts the attention from, okay, remember there's a larger war going on here. It isn't just the slaughter at Fredericksburg or what's to come at Chancellorsville. There's, there's more to talk about here. And I think that would get people to think in a, in a broader term, you know, and so then they can't just walk away dismissive of the battle or dismissive of Burnside because they realize that these, the momentum keeps going, right? The war continues, even if it seems like, um, you know, this is a complete disaster, there are still pieces to be drawn from it. John, we have my last Fredericksburg question in and then I'll let okay. you. <laughs> so how did you handle the very, I would say, beautiful monument dedicated to Richard Kirkland the angel of Marines mm. Heights, a monument that I believe was dedicated, was it dedicated in 1962 or 60? It was dedicated. Yeah, around the centennial. Yeah, yeah, for the centennial of the battle. So Beth, would you mind just very briefly telling our audience the story about Kirkland and your sort of take on that story and how you handled that monument, which for those of you who have not been to Fredericksburg, it's right on the stone wall. Uh, and of course, below the stone wall is the, um, the open ground that led up to Marie's Heights that the Union soldiers attacked over. So yeah, tell us about Kirkland real quickly and then about- Sure. The yeah, so Kirkland is a pretty fascinating story in that um, as, the, as the story comes to us, the short version being that um, in the aftermath of the Battle of Fredericksburg, there are untold Union wounded left out on the plains in front of the town. And back behind the stone wall, you have uh, a, a Sergeant Richard Kirkland who is listening to the cries of the wounded and can't stand it, goes to ask his commanding officer if he can take um, water, other things out to the wounded. Um, and he finally gets permission to go across, um, although he's refused to be able to take a white flag. So he goes over, gathers up a bunch of canteens and starts giving water to the wounded soldiers. Um, there's now a monument to Kirkland. It is really, it is beautiful. It's um, yeah, it's just, it's a very remarkable monument and statue, but um, there's some challenges, right? We, uh, Kirkland dies uh, at Chickamauga, so he's, we can't ask him post-war if that happens. His story surfaces many, many years later. Um, there's not much corroborating evidence, there's some, and I think we can say with some certainty that there was aid given by a Confederate or more than one Confederate to the Union soldiers who are wounded out in the field, but we don't know for certain that it's Kirkland. Um, we really, there's a lot of pieces that don't add up. So it can be a little bit problematic, but it's the statue itself is dedicated in the 60s and the centennial. You know, it's an era of good feelings and wanting to encourage brotherhood um, between the two sides and, and kind of play out that memory of we were all soldiers and it was okay in the end. Um, in terms of the way that I treated it, it really depends. I have to confess that some days I wasn't feeling Kirkland at all, and we just didn't make it that far. You know, you can stop um, <laughs> by the Innes House and just finish there and say that hey, there are more important things to talk about because yeah. it seems like the perfect centerpiece ending. We're gonna talk about how uh, humanity can transcend the battlefield, but really when you're talking about a battlefield where a person could walk from one end to the other without touching a blade of grass, um, humanity isn't really the thing you might want to talk about. Um, sometimes I would give people the full story if I had the time and say, you know, it's up to you all to decide what you want to believe. You know, if you want to believe that this is the story of humanity, you want to see Kirkland as somebody who's representative, you know, it's, it's not really for me to tell you what to make of this monument, but what I always wanted to encourage people to do was to think more deeply about that monument and all monuments, because all monuments tell us the story. They tell us the story about what people wanted them to tell us, you know. It's not necessarily the story that you think just from looking at it. 
it's a story that people want today. I mean, I, as you know, Beth, cut my teeth as an interpreter at Fredericksburg when I was in college and gave many a walk along the sunken road. And I incorporated that story without ever challenging the visitors to think deeply about it because as Beth, you alluded to that monument of Kirkland cradling a Union soldier, a wounded Union soldier and giving that soldier uh, water is the kind of feel good story, the bedtime story that Americans want. So Beth and John, you're gonna hear it here first. When I retire from this position, I'm going to Fredericksburg, I'm going back, right? Back home, so to speak. I'm gonna volunteer if they let me. I'll volunteer. I got to make amends. I'm taking every group out there and I'm going to end up by pointing to that <laughs> monument and I'm going to yell, bedtime story. That's what people want. And it is an absurdity, right? Hmm. That monument's important and it's beautiful. And it speaks, as you said, Beth, to how we want to imagine and see our civil war. But of course, it obliges us to the absolute zeal and joy that the Confederates took in shooting down all those Union soldiers. I'm reminded of Gods and Generals, a movie that's full of all kinds of absurdities, but one of the one of the most ridiculous moments is the Confederate Irish soldier crying as he's shooting down members of the Irish Brigade. Hmm. Bedtime story, that's what mm -hmm. that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, there are some quotations that have Confederates feeling badly or sort of expressing that they feel badly for shooting um, brave men but I don't think it stopped them, which I think is an important thing to note, right? And then there are some who are like, we'll kill every Yankee you put in front of us. No, no, no. So, there was a, one North Carolinian who stood up and said, set them up again as if they were bowling pins, right? I mean, E.P. Alexander was joyful about it because they were all infuriated by what the Yankees had done to the town of Fredericksburg. I don't condemn either side. You know, it's a war. And that's, of course, what for so long, the Fredericksburg interpretation I think tried to keep us from understanding that for so long. I think that's changed in the last 15 to 20 years, which again, John, you might have some questions about Chancellorsville or Fredericksburg, but we have a lot to talk about in terms of mathematics because the interpretations there have changed radically since my days. This is all about Pete tonight, Beth. You did not know that. <laughs> You laid the groundwork. Oh, I was one of your students. I know how it goes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Wow. Give yourself to these kids, and this is what they do. Beth, by the way, I don't see a copy of my book behind you on one of your shelves. It's not probably. Really? It's, uh, it's over here. Buried. What, Buried. One of them. No, actually, you should take that. So it's it's top shelf. Now, top. my top shelf is really like middle a middle shelf, but it is literally top shelf. Easy, easy to reach. Okay, nice. good. You've made a nice. miss. We're good now. Awesome. All right. So, so John, did you want to take it over here, John? I don't know where you want to lead us, but go to. Yeah. It. First, I want to give a shout out to Beth because I found out that she's a Beaker fan from the Muppets, which is great because I have a Beaker background that I can put up back here sometime to throw people off. So, Beth, thank you for adding that class to our discussion before we went live. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, what? How was your transition for interpretation? when you went from Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville to Appomattox, how, how did that transition work for you personally? You know, it was very, very interesting because, so Fredericksburg in South Pennsylvania, for anyone who doesn't know, is Fredericks has the battlefields for Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Wilderness and Spotsylvania Courthouse. So it spans from December of 1862 through mid-May of 1864. And you would tend to think especially for those to whom the war is Gettysburg and then Appomattox, you would tend to think that if you have a grasp of the war in May of 1864, then you can go pretty logically on to um, April of 1865. And what I found was the armies are barely recognizable. So um, it was a big shift to me uh, to go from the armies that I knew to these almost brand new fighting forces. I mean, Army of the James was fairly new for me anyway, but um, it was a big shift in terms of understanding the armies. And then I think a big shift as well from um, kind of battlefield interpretation culture to at Appomattox, we preserve basically a reconstructed and some some parts historic and some parts reconstructed historic village. Um, we're talking about the site of least surrender primarily. So there is a military story. There's fighting on April 9th, there's fighting on April 8th. There's the whole campaign to get there. Um, but, it's, but there's very much a different kind of story. There's a different air at Appomattox and people come to hear about the surrender and about that kind of humanity and civility 
more than they come to hear the military story, although they're interested in that as well. So it was a shift both um, in terms of, of where we're at in the war and a shift in terms of, of subject matter even. Hmm. How ingrained is that where we were just talking about the Kirkland Monument and this idea of what, how we have perceived the, the Civil War in the past? And then you go to Appomattox and I would think it would be like this, you know, the same kind of mythology hanging out together in a different capacity. Is that yeah, really true? There's, there's a lot of it. Um, and it's something that and the park we're always coming up against, you know, even as you drive into Appomattox County, the sign says we're the nation reunited. And we're always like, not really, sort of, <laughs> but not really. Um, and actually one of the first history books I ever had, which is actually in arms reach here, Lee and Granite Appomattox. Isn't that, that's, that's you know, beautiful. And this was my dad's. Um, so it's something that he he grew up with and it's got these these brilliant little illustrations. In the, oh yeah, I remember um, <laughs> yeah, they're fantastic, right? Mm -hmm. Except that if you read it, you're going to come away with a very different impression of Appomattox than necessarily what we would want you to walk away with today. Um, it's one of that focuses very much on civility. Um, that interestingly, I think focuses hyper focuses. Although Pete may appreciate this, on what each general is wearing. You know, we can we can talk about how <laughs> Lee, the consummate gentleman, is. Um, is reflected in his clothing, whereas the hard scrabble Grant shows up in his mud spattered boots. And somehow that's supposed to tell us something about the character of each of them and the arc of this entire story. Um, it's a story that, that generally ends April 9th with Lee's, well, April 10th, Lee's dramatic farewell uh, address. Um, mm. You know, all of these sort of things that help to build toward the lost cause. Um, whereas today we really look at April 9th as the beginning of the end and then the beginning toward reconstruction. You know, it's the beginning of emancipation. It's the beginning of the surrenders of Confederate armies, major armies in the field. You know, it's, it's really a turning point instead of the end and then there was peace. Um, it also shows some shifting mindsets. You know, if you ask Appomattox citizens around the turn of the century, um, and somebody did, you know, in the early efforts to establish parks and memorials. And the, the Southern people here were quick to remind everybody that, um, in fact, we weren't so keen on remembering it that way. Thank you very much. A lot of things were lost that day. Um, whereas today we see it as, oh, great, the war was ending, the nation's coming back together. Um, but we also try to see more of the complications today, I think, than, um, than in the past. Let's talk about one of those complications. So you mentioned this issue of emancipation, which did not obviously begin with Appomattox. It's an ongoing process, sure. so wartime emancipation. But you're correct. You know, it's often perceived by people that when Lee and Grant shook hands, that that resolved the war in a tidy fashion. And so I think that not just scholars, but public historians, they now, as you've uh, I think put it nicely, that they see this as part of an ongoing story. So here we go. Tell, uh, right. There's a challenge here though. And, and there's a challenge at all these historic sites to be able to bring in the African-American story. Tell us how it's a problem on many levels. It's a, a problem in terms of sources, it's a problem in terms of a site, it's a problem in terms of visitors, or you can call it challenges because I forgot. Yeah, I, no I think challenge is a better word. There's no problems in this world, John. I forgot about that. <laughs> right. Just challenges and challenges. Just challenges and opportunities. So tell us about the challenges of the interpretation of African American history and mathematics. Yeah, and I do, I much prefer the word challenge because I think that we should see it more as an opportunity to fix something that we haven't done very well in the past. Um, and I think it starts if you go all the way back to the founding of these parks, you know, Appomattox is founded in the 30s and 40s. Um, it's a segregated park, just like other parks in Virginia at that time. So we're always building on this foundation that ultimately has its roots in segregation and white supremacy. So there's our first problem, which is actually a problem. problem. Um, like straight out of the gate, we got a problem. Um, but you know, you mentioned a couple other things. We have the scarcity of sources, which is is in some ways everywhere. But one of the the lovely things about being a community as opposed to a devastated battlefield where there's so many of the enslaved people who lived in the area and just 
they ran away and then it's hard to track what they did. You know, emancipation, which is a process, I shouldn't really say that it begins in Appomattox, um, but in Appomattox in this area, the enslaved people didn't have much of a chance to run to Union lines before this point. So Grant's arrival, Lee's surrender really sparks that movement in this area, which means that after emancipation, there are a lot of folks who continue to settle in the area. So we have things to work with. We have some, some WPA narratives. We have um, records to work with. So there are sources. It's just not the sources we've traditionally mined. So whereas if you want to know the movements of an individual unit at the Battle of Appomattox Courthouse, we probably have a dozen records that can tell us a lot in detail. You know, we are still working on um, knowing the exact number of enslaved people that belonged to any given slaveholder in mm -hmm. Appomattox at any given time, right? So there's a lot that we don't know, but there's still a lot that we can know and that we can build on. Um, I think a lot of it is just shifting that culture, you know, to focus less on what the generals were wearing on what traveler had for breakfast and a little bit more on um, what does this matter and what are the opportunities and challenges of reconstruction? Well, I'll just say that um, the change in interpretive approach is uh, it's truly revolutionary from when, see, I told you it was going to be about me. Summer, <laughs> summer of 1985, summer of 1985, my very first job in the Park Service was to portray uh, Corporal Bobby Fields, who I believe is still portrayed at Appomattox. And <laughs> we had- uh, Probably <laughs> so. We had to do first person interpretation, which for the our audience, if you don't know what that means, I had to pretend that it was the summer of 1865 and Fields was a corporal in a Pennsylvania unit that did provost duty there uh, in Appomattox. And so there's an abundance of records that Mark Greenow, Mark Greenow, who is the curator of the um, Richmond, uh, Virginia State Capitol Museum. And Mark Greenow did just incredible research that made it of course available to us now look i'm i'm 19 years old i didn't have the historiography and i had to pretend it was 1865 and the source material in which the freedmen's bureau complained bitterly about freed people former slaves african americans complained bitterly that they would not work now here again is a problem of first person interpretation. It's a problem of, and this is a serious one, when public historians like myself didn't know the historiography, didn't know the context. Now, I don't know what I could have done, even if I had known that, I had to pretend it was 1865. You can only imagine what right. the result was or response when I spoke to visitors and said, we're struggling to get black people to work here. Now, the reason why the Freedmen's Bureau wrote that historically, we know because they wanted to not work on the terms of their former landowners. And those terms were coercive. And they were, of course, terms that would have led to their impoverishment. These were African-Americans who were playing. And this goes back to what Brian Lusky spoke about last Thursday. They wanted to play the free market game. But those, of course, who owned the capital and owned the land didn't want to play by those rules. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it is too bad that when I was there that I didn't have a Beth Parnitska. I had a, some really good people I worked with, but they were all very much centered within that 1960s perception or interpretation of, mm. of Appomattox. So things have changed so much. I have two students that I can think of off the top of my head that have worked at Appomattox. They both came back to Gettysburg College and they both told me about programs in which story of African-Americans was not just on the margins of their interpretation, but right in the wheelhouse. And again, for those people who say, hey, these things don't change, just not the case at all, right? Not the case at all. Yeah. Well, and I think it's an opportunity for us to, to make them more centered. You know, we've been having, actually, even just among my staff this week, we've been talking a lot about um, telling new stories and different stories. And my hope is at least that some of your students were telling the story of John Robinson, who to me is, um, does a lot to embody the stories of reconstruction. You know, he lives within the village, the home that he purchased right after the war is still standing. He helped to found the first African-American church in Appomattox. He registered to vote right, right off of that. Um, and you can use a story like John Robinson's where 
even though we have very little that he actually said himself, right. um, we can still construct around that to say he registered to vote. Do you know what it took to register to vote? Right. He's, hmm. Yeah, he sent his students to school. This first African-American school was built across from the McLean house, just a few through stones throws up the road. You know, it's right within the park, right within the area that we talk about. That school was threatened by the Klan as was the school teacher. So we can talk about, you know, there are some opportunities and then there's some things that could go terribly wrong if you take advantage of those opportunities. Well, so what kind of peace was brought? Yeah. Well, I, again, I think that uh, it's, a, it's a powerful response to anyone who comes to Appomattox and claims that the war was a great tragedy and that this loss of life did not, um, didn't result in any profound consequences or changes. And you've just pointed out, Robinson got to vote, black school, the Klan. I mean, these are all things, again, I'm not trying to suggest that for African-Americans, that their initiation into citizenship was complete. I'm not, no one's suggesting that. But what you've pointed out is something that is right on the ground and should really get a hold of visitors in a pretty powerful way. Mm. Absolutely. Beth, what is uh, one of the greater challenges to deal with at Appomattox? Is, that, is it that idea of how it, quote, ended? Is it that idea of uh, once in a while you have visitors who truly believe the way we thought of it in the 1960s with the, with the when, when lost causing initiatives were in textbooks all over the country? Is, it, is that some of the harder challenges you face or is it something else? as an interpreter or as an yeah. piece of interpretation, I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that's fine. It's a couple of things. I mean, some of it is, is trying to get our visitors to stay longer and invest in the park and realize that there's more to see than just the McLean house. Um, but a lot of them are the ones that you mentioned. You know, a lot of visitors, if they come to Appomattox, one of the, the lovely things about being here in the middle of nowhere is that um, people come to Appomattox because they mean to, because they've heard that, they were remember it from school and it means something to them. So a lot of our visitors come because they find deep meaning here. And um, part of what I love is that they find a very peaceful atmosphere and they find that that, that reflects, you know, what they think happened. And so part of it is complicating it, you know, remembering, hey, there's a whole campaign that gets us here. Some people mm -hmm. don't think about, you know, Robert E. Lee's back into a corner before he decides to surrender. He doesn't just wake up one morning and say, you know, I think it's time for this war to be over. Mm -hmm. He's actually, tracked. Um, so there's that level of we need to expand that story. We need to, to expand the story of the surrender. So let's understand the terms. Let's understand what they mean, um, what their implications are for uh, soldiers across the South and for the nation at large, for how Lee responds with his, with his farewell orders that most people just think are written so beautifully, and they are. But there's also little bits uh, sewn throughout those farewell orders that say, uh, or that farewell order that says a lot about what many in our nation would come to believe. It sows the seeds of the lost cause that are already sown everywhere. Um, and then, so we're, we're often coming up against all of these ideas, these preconceived notions about Appomattox and what it means and what it could be. Um, so some of it's telling the story, some of it's adding to the story, some of it is helping people to understand that, again, this is in some ways a beginning or a turning point, it's really not the end. We're pivoting toward reconstruction and what the country will become after Appomattox. I, I think you've said that so nicely, Beth. Could you tell us, and I, I, I know that you weren't at Appomattox during the 150th, right? But I think yeah. that what Appomattox did is something that John and I have talked about on numerous occasions. In fact, we devoted an entire show to the relationship between public historians and academic historians. And I think that I will speak for John here, but I think that he and I both believe that for the most part, we're truly allies. We're partners in this enterprise. And the 150th at Appomattox, I think, revealed that. So I'm interested in, in the 150th and especially interested in the ways that you all, Ernie Price, your predecessor, I believe, he was a big part of this, how you were able to connect to the African-American community in Appomattox. Yeah, so Ernie, um, who I have, just an immense and unending respect for. Uh, Ernie did a lot of, of kind of the background work that's required. You know, there's there's still, even though there's a, a fair amount of 
um, African Americans who leave Appomattox County after the war, um, fair wages being a big part of why, you know, and, and other complicating factors, but there's still a vibrant African American community here. And because we started out as a segregated park, and because there were interpretations related to the lost cause for such a long time, I think that the park has not historically been a place that the African American community felt welcome in. And so Ernie, um, in many ways, started the outreach to them. Um, so he, along with our museum technician, David Woodbridge, did a lot to reach out to the Carver Price Museum, which is a local um, a museum talking about civil rights and deeply involved with the African-American community. He went to speak to Galilee Baptist Church, which is the church that John Robinson helped to found in, in Appomattox um, and just started working with the local African-American community. Um, there's a, a prominent pastor named Al Jones in the community who also does a lot with African-American history. So he worked with Al. Um, and he started to, to talk to them about what would be a, a good and meaningful commemoration. And he wanted to do more than just commemorate the surrender. He wanted to talk about what this meant, what were the reverberations outward. And so he and Al Jones and others were able to, to settle on the story of Hannah Reynolds, who was the only civilian casualty in the fighting at Athematics. And she was an enslaved woman. And they found that actually they thought that she had died almost immediately, but she was treated and she did not die for another three days, which is a serious distinction because that meant in Appomattox, she was wounded as an enslaved person and she died a free woman. Wow. So even though she may not have been, I mean, who knows how conscious she was of that fact, mm -hmm. but it's still pretty powerful, right? So they took her story um, and they gave her a large funeral as part of the 150th commemoration. And it was one of the sort of cornerstone um, programs of the entire commemoration. Um, Ernie Price won the Freeman Tilden Award, which is a big award for interpretation in the, in the NPS for it. Um, but really, I think it was because he put in a lot of late nights. He did a lot of the networking with communities saying, well, what programs would you like to see? What would represent well um, for the African-American community and to tell the story? And I think it's important, you know, representation at large is important. Um, it's not enough for me to say that I think we should talk about the African-American story. We need to have African-American perspectives. And we need to have all the perspectives at the table. And Ernie did a lot to make sure that that happened for the 150th. It's a it's really a remarkable accomplishment. And I suspect there are other Civil War parks that engaged in similar outreach, but I, certainly the Appomattox one really stands out. And during the ceremony, I remember Ed Ayers came down and he spoke and other academics. And the point again being um, everybody working together and, uh, and bringing, as you've just mentioned, uh, stakeholders, right? Shareholders in the park, bringing them together is pretty, is pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. so, so Beth, I'm a visitor at the park. I, I, I wanna, I'm a visitor at the park. I come to you. And you're sure. telling me that the Civil War was a revolution. And you point to Mr. Robinson, he said, look, that man was a slave, he got the right to vote. And you also point out to me that those enslaved people, they're now workers and they're not being treated fairly, but nonetheless, they're still, of course, trying to get a wage. And I say to you, Miss Parnitska, don't tell me this is a revolution. Because when Lee surrendered, they didn't hang him from an apple tree. In fact, the apple tree that he was supposedly taking a nap under, everybody, including Union soldiers, wanted a scrap of it. And those Confederate soldiers, they had to go through a formal surrender process. And no, maybe that was humiliating. But they were allowed to go home with a pass to say that they're unmolested or that federal authorities cannot molest them as long as they did not take up arms against the United States. We see the terms that Grant gave to R.E. Lee, and those terms seem to be, again, fairly generous for the most part. And then finally, we'll go back to Lee's farewell address. Um, I, I think you played that too soft. That's a chilling address. Yes, the language is, is it's beautiful in places. But what that language says to those men is that you were not defeated. Right? You were worn down. That we were, in fact, never ever lost on the battlefield and for again our sacrifice that you've made it is one that you should take pride and honor in what re lee did in that address is more than a lost cause it's saying to his men 
carry on the struggle, boys, one way or another, carry it on. And now you're going to tell me that this is a revolution? As a visitor, I need to understand how you can make that argument. That's a great, that's a really great point. So I think, you know, if you came to me as a visitor and said that, I would, I would start asking you a series of questions, right? Because I want you to start figuring it out for yourself. Um, so I would start with questions like, what do you think the terms were appropriate? Do you think that Robert, what should Robert E. Lee have said to his men? Is it reasonable to expect him to say anything else to his men? What if the Union Army or Union high authorities had been tougher on the Confederates? How do you think this would have played out? I mean, and that's not to avoid your question, but to say, we don't know. You know, We don't know what would have happened. Um, I can tell you that Reconstruction was abysmal, but, and I can even tell you in great detail why, or why it, it um, in so many ways failed, but I can also tell you that in some ways it succeeded. So, you know, for John Robinson, is he better off than he was before? To play devil's advocate, is that a really a great measure? Because his life could have been immensely better if he had been able to, say, get land from former slaveholders that was just granted to him. So are there limitations? Absolutely. But aren't, aren't there limitations to all revolutions? Did the terms go far enough? Who am I to say? Uh, I don't know. Um, I can tell you that for, for every John Robinson, there's a multitude of enslaved people who had nowhere near the options that he had. And you could easily say that it didn't go far enough, um, that the promises of freedom were broken for them. and Instead, they have to try to fight fight for what wages they can get while slavehold or former slaveholders, landowners are fighting over how low they can get the wages for these formerly enslaved people and banding together to make sure that they stay low and that no one no one outprices them and gets all of the workers. You know, all of these systems start to get in, get in place. Um, these words are dangerous. Well, so, what does that tell us? It tells us it's not a complete revolution. Well. I, I, I like your response a great deal. And of course, I attribute uh, your response to the superb training you got at WVU. I think you're right. When you think in binaries, as I try to pose that, right, it's either one thing or the other. That's problematic. Although I think there's a lot there to discuss and for us, as you've just pointed out, to have a conversation about. Mm -hmm. John, I'll let you have another whack here at Ms. Parniska. <laughs> Well, Beth, I actually have a, a question from our online audience uh, that this kind of in, kind of an interesting question. Speaking about uh, when we're talking about uh, post-war stuff and how Appomattox is seen and things like that, and I don't know why I'm going out of focus as well. My my shirt must be too loud on the screen. I don't know what's going on. We want to see more of Ottawa. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Uh, how did uh, how did the radical Republicans respond to those terms when they heard about them after Appomattox? Uh, that, that's, uh, that's something that uh, one person would love to know in the comments because we were just talking about were they too lenient, were, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, you know, I think, um, and this, I'm gonna start to show some of my own uh, limitations because I am by no means a political historian. I try to weave it in as best I can, but um, it's, it's my least favorite thing. So from what I can tell, the radical Republicans took a much, uh, a much more unhappy tense to Reconstruction as it goes along. Um, my guess would be that they were probably not thrilled with the generous terms, but I do not know. Um, that's a good question. Oh, I don't think they he might be able to answer. They, they didn't think in a unified way. So that's, I think, an important point. I think the second point is a recognition that there is military victory Right, that has been achieved. And so how do you preserve that military victory and a recognition among at least some radical Republicans that if you go easy, that you might then stop the continuation of warfare in another form being guerrilla warfare. I think they quickly become, as we know, disenchanted with uh, Andrew Johnson and we don't need to go down that rabbit hole. But, and they also, again, you know, it's hard to come down hard on Grant and Sherman because everyone knew that those policies were done in consultation with Abe Lincoln. You got a martyr president. Doesn't make for good politics, right? To criticize a martyr president. But in time, it didn't take much before they, get, they got frustrated with that. Right. We have, I have one more question, but do we have any more questions from our audience? I don't want to deprive them 
and the opportunity. Although they can come to Appomattox but, and ask you in person. Uh, they, they yeah, need to. So to take a whack. Wow. I, I do have a confession. I have never been to Appomattox. Oh my God, John. What? Never. I've well, never been to Appomattox. I've been to so many Eastern Front battlefields, you know, Eastern theater. Never been to Appomattox. I need to. You haven't even seen the war. Never. I mean, no, I know. I, I have never <laughs> finished it. I have never finished it. But John, it's okay. It's okay. You've been to Ottawa and you've been to been, Ottawa. Yeah. Oh, I mean, that, yeah. makes, that makes up for it. Yeah, that makes up for everything. I've been to some well, come on down any time. Yeah. 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 After all this pandemic is over, I'm sure I'll. I'll we should do a live show down there, John. We should go. We should start doing a live show. I've said that. I said I wanted to bring out some folding chairs and just set it up like a lawn party. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just have bug spray. I don't like bugs. <laughs> yeah, no, no, there's <laughs> probably plenty of those at Appomattox. So I've got another question. We'll sit on the porch. Lift us up a little bit from the bugs. That's yeah. good with me. Go ahead, Pete. So, Beth. Um, yeah. Talk, talk to us about what it means to be a, a woman historian mm. practicing Civil War history in particular. And what have been, again, I can't say the word problems. And I can't say challenges. <laughs> I'll say opportunities, but I know there were challenges and I know there were problems, but you just said how it's changed over time. And I should add very quickly, Beth, Beth also received from the Dallas Civil War Roundtable, the <laughs> Grady McWinney Award, the great, which is Grady McWinney was a famous wow. Southern Civil War historian. It's quite an honor. Uh, so she's talked on the table circuit as well. Yeah, they love you in Dallas. I gave a talk yeah. down there. All they could do was rave about you. I wasn't dubious <laughs> at all. Well, I love them too. They're they're fantastic and smart and thoughtful group. And I love speaking to round tables in general because they're all so much fun. Yeah. Um, well, Pete, first I think I have to ask you, what's it like to be a man in the Civil War field, right? Well, it certainly has changed, right? And seriously, it has changed a lot. And I think almost all for the better. I, I'm, you know, when I was a seasonal historian, it was almost impossible to find a woman a, a, of college <laughs> to apply for in the jobs. It was just not there, right? And so, I mean, it's a, it's a problem, well, in the field, right? It's, it's changed. Yeah, well, it's all for the yeah. Better, so I, think. I mean, I think one yeah, of the I'll think being a man now. Yeah. I know you're, but I mean, there's, I mean, I think there's really no challenge for being a man and practicing Civil War history. Although I think that I will speak broadly now. I think there are times that we are, as men or I am, I'm hesitant to say something, the fear that I'll be labeled either as a racist or as a sexist. So, for example, you know, when I told you about when I was 19 and I took the sources literally and spoke about the African-American experience in first person. I'm nervous about saying that. I'm nervous in today's social media world that someone will extract that point and say, look what Pete Carmichael did. I think Twitter, of course, has created monsters out of many of our colleagues who I love at a conference. I love face-to-face -face conversations with them, but on Twitter, they're unrecognizable to me. So I think, again, I'm always nervous now to be perceived as being a sexist or a racist in some of my comments that I don't think are, but I think that that is something that, at least for me personally, and maybe that's a good thing that I'm more aware of what I'm saying so that it won't be misconstrued. So now we're thinking sure. about Sure, what helps to be mindful, but yeah, yeah. I'll, take, I'll take the bait. Um, I think for me, you know, I've always been, and I didn't always feel this way. To me, the greatest lesson of being a woman practicing civil war history in the public history world is, is that representation matters. I mentioned that already once, but, and I didn't always think that way. You know, when I first started out, my colleagues and coworkers and bosses were so supportive of me that even the occasional visitor who seemed to not know what to do with me, or I won't even start on some of the things that people said to me, it we runs the full it. gamut. Yeah, um, a few, we should know it. People should hear us. What are some of the things that people okay. should um, well, one of the most prominent ones that comes to mind is actually not saying anything to me. I've watched people queue up in line to speak to the intern who happened to be male who was next to me, whereas me in full uniform being the building supervisor was trying to wave people over to please talk to me um, and they were resisting. Yes. And I'm like, I promise I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. um, right. And still after 20 minutes of conversation with the same person that I had to wave over as soon as my male intern colleague was finished, he looked up and asked him the very next question that he had. Um, I've had visitors who don't seem to think that I want to 
to be working where I'm working. I've had visitors who have walked in and said that um, that they think that they're that they're convinced that they probably know more about this than I do, and here's why. And oh, you've probably never heard of General Barksdale, and I'm like, I promise you that I have, but you may know more than I do. I don't know. Um, so a lot of those sorts of things. Um, most mostly people who just don't don't really know or think that I only talk about women's topics, that sort of thing. But what I think meant the most to me as a woman in the field, because again, to me, I just brush it off. They'll figure it out or they won't if I know what I'm talking about. Um, but what really stuck with me and part of what made it important to me was leading an education group. And so these were maybe third or fourth grade kids. And I don't lead a lot of school groups. It's not my specialty, um, but occasionally. And so we're walking down the sunken road and I'm getting all these questions as third and fourth graders do, you know, and I realized that each of them was from a, a small female child, right? And I look around, I suddenly look down and I am ringed by these young girls everywhere. And that is not what anyone expects to see on a battlefield, right? As a female ranger leading a battle walk with like six girls all around her, like leaving their boy comrades in the dust. And that to me was it, right? We have more and more every year, there's more and more female interns, seasonals, and they're starting to move up into the ranks of permanent. Um, and yet I still see a lot of feelings persisting that we don't know what we're talking about. We only study women. Um, and it, it hurts, you know, because I want those little girls to think that what they think is true, you know, that anybody can do this. I've got a place up there. And so, um, yeah. representation matters there's a lot of us out there just look I, for us i i yeah. remember oh. that's pete's starting to freeze up oh no <laughs> he'll come back in no, I, yeah. oh, she had a boy and a girl and she said to me well, i come here for she said i come here for the battlefield she said i come here for my son and uh and i said you know but i don't know if i'm here we go and I said, you know, you can come here for your daughter as well. Like, like it's not just yeah. for boy. Like, that was not we can boy. also, yeah, we can also be interested. And I think, you know, that's why I think it's always important, whether you're doing a Facebook Live or a conference or a battlefield tour or whatever, you know, make sure that, that women and people of color are involved because the more young people and the more old people that see that we're out there, the more they realize, oh, hey, they can be competent too. Or if they're young, hey, I can do that too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think some of the coolest Civil War historians right now who are bringing out monographs are women anyway. I mean, there's a lot of great women authors out there right now. And there's not, and that's not, you know, we, we're, we're overlooking many of the women as yourself who are in the, in the field, literally <laughs> doing what it's doing by saying that. But we can look at the top down and see that women are making a big impact on the field right now. And I know for me personally, I can't wait for the day where I'm the only white male on a panel. It's like, and that'll be the norm. <laughs> well, that'll know, be the norm. I can't wait for that where it's like, I, oh, okay. And I, cool. and I'm going to be hopelessly naive here. And I can't wait for the day where I can't wait for the day that that stuff doesn't matter so much. Right. I, I mean, I'm yeah. hoping for the day that we just sort of judge a historian for what they have to say. Right. One could say that's hopelessly naive. And so I guilty as charged, but I, I, well, one, there's more women in the field of public history than men, mm -hmm. period. And now we're seeing again, as best pointed out, with our Pohanka intern program, we placed nearly 30 students. I'd say more than 50% are women that, that we place. So it's all a good thing. We just got to reach out to everyone. And we can't forget poor people. I don't care what their color is or what their gender is. I care about the people in central PA who live you know, 30 miles from here and never get to this battlefield. I care about the Latino population in Adams County here who never gets to the battlefield. I care about the people in Baltimore who never get this. And they're, they got one thing that unites them. They're poor, they're poor. And uh, I'm hoping that our field will get more and more sensitive to the class realities as to, there's a lot of the people that are making up the ranks. They go to research one schools, they're almost Ivy League. And that's where the privilege resides in our field right now. It's the Ivy League schools. That's where it resides. I just want to say, just to get a concluding thing about Beth, because you can only <laughs> imagine how I feel being a part of her intellectual educational life. It is, uh, it is, it's better than any damn book I'll ever ever write. Period. 
to know that Beth is going to be out there and you know, already she's working with my students. So this makes me feel old as hell that you're like <laughs> the teacher to my students is just not, doesn't feel right to me at all. And the other thing I want to say is Beth, Beth gives some great talks. She's been at the Civil War Institute. She does a fantastic talk on Stonewall Jackson's May 2nd map or Chancellorsville map, I should say. Is that correct, Beth? Well, you know, if you're if you're bringing up the most the most famous last map, my argument is entirely if you'd paid attention, Pete, is that it was done on uh, probably late late on April 30th or early May 1st. But yes, I, I, I was listening. I just didn't buy your argument. I still thought. <laughs> oh well, bring it because we just talked about how awesome female historians are. So oh, that's all right. Let's yeah, let's yeah. battle royale next CWI. Absolutely, go. <laughs> Absolutely. So, hey, Beth, it's such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you again for all you're doing, especially during this time of the pandemic and getting Appomattox ready for a summer season. I'm excited that my students are going to be down there and uh, in some way, some form, still working with the American people. That's, that's important. Yes. Absolutely. I'm looking, well, I'm thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to my first day at Appomattox, too, to meet you in person, Beth. And, yeah. and, and Absolutely. And Just let us know when you're coming. <laughs> yeah, that'd be awesome. But yeah, we'll roll out the red carpet. Yeah. Awesome. Well, you don't have to do that. Just, just I don't need <laughs> well, to. We can carpet. do the the like red and green checkered McLean House parlor carpet. How's okay. that? That's that's fine. Uh, yeah, that's good. We'll do that. But now, thank you for being on, Beth. It's been awesome, and uh, I'm I'm glad to hear that uh, all the interpretation is going well there. And I've always said that a a great site is is run by a great chief of interpretation. So. <laughs> that's just well, thank you so mind. much. And so you we both have, have been way too kind. Yeah, that's very nice. So next, this Thursday, we have, and Beth, you'll be watching, I'm sure, we will have Tim Silver and Judkin Brownie, both are professors at uh, Appalachia State, and they will be talking about their new book, just released by the University of North Carolina Press, their environmental history of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. I am usually prepared <laughs> and I do not see it. I don't have the book in front of me, uh, but uh, I will on Thursday. And so we hope to see everybody seven o'clock Thursday, Judkin Browning and Tim Silver about the environmental history of the war. Yes. And thank you again, Beth, for being on. Really appreciate it. Sure. Well, thanks to you both. And thank you all for tuning in. We will see you Thursday evening at seven o'clock. See you guys. <laughs>